Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last session of the March 2021 Advocacy Sector Conversation Forum. My name is Melissa Hayo, and I'm the coordinator of the Disability Advocacy Resource Unit. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Once again, we are delivering the Advocacy Sector Conversations Forum to you online. We hope at some stage to be able to de deliver the series face to face when it's safe to do so in an inclusive and accessible way. However, we hope you've all settled in comfortably and are ready for a fantastic series. We, hope, we encourage your active participation today. So please type your questions in the Q&A box and at the end of the session, I will be facilitating a Q&A session with our presenter. The last session for this series is around building community networks, circles of support. Advocates stand alongside the person with a disability to make sure that their voices are heard in all matters that affect them. However, skilling up people with disability to utilise choice and control takes time and is not currently recognised under current advocacy funding models. Circles of support are a process where intentional networks of people are built around a person with a disability to assist them in creating a good life in community and supporting their decision making through developing trusted relationships. Theresa McAuliffe is responsible for building community networks at Belonging Matters. In this session, she will share her experiences of the Circles of Support initiative, including the positive outcomes for all involved in promoting decision-making support, as well as the limitations and challenges she encounters. To step us through this process and how it works, please welcome Theresa McCullough. Thank you, Melissa, for that lovely introduction and for sharing a little bit about Circles of Support. I am, um, as way of introduction, I um, do head up the Circles of Support project here at Belonging Matters, which helps people with intellectual disability and or autism primarily um, set up a circle of support around themselves, um, which often includes family members, friends, allies from the community. I also facilitate, and we do that for about 10 to 12, 13 people um, at this point in time. I also facilitate a number of circles of support myself, so I'm in there doing that work with families and individuals and their networks. And I also do sit in on a circle of support in a voluntary capacity, you know, as a friend of a person. So um, I guess I'm... I've been privileged enough to have involvement on a number of levels in relation to circles. So I hope I can share some of that with you today. It would be lovely to have you all in person, um, as Melissa alluded to, so perhaps one day. So I thought I'd start just by telling you a little bit about Belonging Matters, who we are. Many of you may, you may or may not know about us, so just very briefly. Uh, we're a disability and family-driven grassroots organisation. Our vision has always been that a community strengthened by the inclusion of all, so that all people, no matter where they come from, um, race, colour, creed, disability, that community is strengthened by the inclusion of all people. So that's kind of our premise, our vision. And our aim has become such um, to actually prevent the exclusion of people with disability from their communities. And we do that in a number of ways. So the prevention of that, because it does still occur, um, as you all know, as advocates. So we do this in a number of ways. And one of those, primarily we focus on capacity building, building the capacity, the, uh, the knowledge, wisdom, understanding of people, individuals, families. A lot of the time we're working with people with intellectual disability and or autism and their families. Uh, but we work, you know, our work touches um, all people. Uh, so we do that in terms of building people's capacity, their understanding and their knowledge about what's possible really. And the focus is on belonging and community inclusion. So 
such important things in people's lives to simply belong to community, to be included. The idea of inclusion is almost ridiculous for people who who don't experience exclusion, because if you know you just are a part of community, you just are a part of your workplace, your home life, you know your school day, whatever it is that you spend your time doing. So, uh, and what we have found, obviously, with people with a disability, is some this needs to be intentionalised. Um, but that is the work that we do talk about that, and we educate people along those lines. We talk a lot about, and we teach to the idea of typical opportunities and typical pathways, so that um, people with disabilities are able to live a life of their choosing in the way that they desire. And we, we, yeah, not not around disability services or segregated or isolated settings. That's certainly not what we would be promoting. We're promoting the typical life that each one of us um, aspires to have and hopefully does have. We talk a lot about valued roles and freely given relationships. And the idea of valued roles is paramount because it, in a way, it counters the uh, the wounding or the um, disempowerment that does occur for people with disabilities in community. So um, we help people to focus on and build truly valued roles for themselves in their life um, and also harness the um, powerful connection that freely given relationships is. And you'll hear a bit about that in relation to circles of support. They are made entirely, generally, of people who are not paid in somebody's life. So the, it, the power of freely given relationships. And again, in terms of advocacy, I'm sure you're aware of the power of that, where people can work outside of systems per, to some degree and simply be with and walk alongside people. We also focus on individuals. You know, we're not working with groups or um, large yeah, institutions. We're talking about one person at a time, individual people and individual life. And we may talk with people around how they might create that and how they might um, be supported to make decisions in the life that, of their choosing. We offer a resource hub, so we have a lot of events, workshops, conferences, we do presentations like this. We too have been doing a lot of webinars last year and this year as well. And you can find all of that information on our website. We have a number of publications, books, that we promote because we think they're good reads, periodicals that we've produced over many, many years that are topical. So if there's a particular topic you're interested in, you could look up a periodical and get information specifically on that. And more recently, we've developing tip sheets around, again, certain topics. We have a website. Um, we do personalised consultation and mentoring, and that's one of the roles I play here at Belonging Matters as well as our CEO, but um, offering consultation to people, sharing their stories, helping guide their way in terms of thinking around inclusion and what um, they might do in terms of their next steps in order to achieve that. We do a lot of leadership development, again, of people supporting people with disabilities and or their families to become leaders in their community, to share their stories in order to inspire um, others who are trying to follow a similar path. And of course, we facilitate circles of support, which is also where I come in. Um, and that project is called, that's called the uh, Building Community Networks. This is also an exceptionally good resource, Talks That Matter, for any of you that are interested in anything in relation to inclusion or even around decision making, those kinds of things. We have hundreds of free clips, video clips of people's lives, but also um, clips of presenters that have shared at our conferences and workshops and such. Many of them are free and you just go online and have a look at those. And we also have then a um, another section, a subscription section, uh, but that, that's quite cheap as well. So, um, and that provides some more in, uh, material that you might be interested in if you want to delve into some topics um, from some very well-known speakers as well. So that's talks that matter. I encourage you to have a look at that. So let's move on to circles of support. The idea of a circle of support is not new. It's a very old concept, the idea of us as human beings um, gathering, you know, gathering around a campfire, 
gathering at events in people's lives, um, gathering to share dreams, gathering to grieve, gathering, we gather as people. Um, and so the, the, that concept is not a fabulously new idea, it's, it's rooted in our humanity. Um, the idea of a concept and the concept of a circle of support originated in Canada over 25 years ago and that's where it was formalised a little more and a little more um, focused then around the intentionality around supporting a person with a disability as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So a circle of support is essentially an intentional way of inviting people to come together in friendship and support of a person with a disability. All of the members of a circle of support are unpaid and this is really important. Apart from perhaps you might have a facilitator and they may have a paid function, um, that's certainly how it works in our project. Um, but, but primarily most of those people in that circle would be unpaid people. If they're not, it begins to become more like a staff team meeting or a therapy meeting or something of that nature and it loses its um, it loses its integrity in terms of a circle of support. They're certainly unique around every person. I facilitate five or six circles. I've facilitated numerous over the last 10 years. They're all different. Every single circle is unique and different. The way I work with a person within a circle is unique and different because each person is different. And they do vary tremendously um, from person to person. You can read a little bit more about all of this and circles of support in issue 26 of um, our periodical if you're interested. Circles of support are not just a social gathering. There may be a social component to them and there is absolutely. People gather, they have meals, they share time together, but they're not just that. They have a function, they have a purpose and there's a reason why people are getting together and that's important to note. They're certainly not team meetings or staff or professional meetings, and I alluded to that earlier. And they're not a service response. This isn't, you know, a service provision, you know, a way of providing for a person with a disability in the way that we would traditionally think that that happens in a disability service system. This is a unique and individual response to an individual based on who they are and by the people around them that love them, that care about them, that know them, and or intentionally bringing people around them who may develop those types of intimate relationships with an individual that are unpaid. They're not a way to fix people or focus on deficits. That's not the, the, um, the idea of a circle. They're really there to harness people's skills, strength, wisdom, and propel them into a life of their own choosing. And there's certainly not a chance to talk about a person uh, when they're not around or even in front of them when they are there, but rather they're an opportunity to involve completely and as much as possible um, an individual in the decision making and the discussions and the ideas and the brainstorming and the planning of around their own life. So they are at the centre um, of everything. When, when you have a circle of support, um, it's all about you, that person at the centre of that circle. Oh, here's just an image of um, the periodical that I mentioned, if issue 26 of our circles of support. So there's a number of stories in here, beautiful stories of people, people's circles of support, of how they set them up, of some of the troubles that they faced along the journey, along the way, uh, some of their learnings um, and such. So if you're interested in circles of support, I encourage you to look at that periodical. This is another important um, or a really good book I would actually recommend people read. It's called The Shouted Goodbye by Jeremy Ward. Um, and this is the story of Mina. Mina um, was a woman who had significant disability and her father Jeremy has documented, I guess, the story of her life, some of the journey that they took as a family in supporting her. She was one of the first children to move, like to to be educated in a mainstream school in Queensland and also one of the first people to live in her own home in Queensland. Uh, and all of that was supported by circles of support, people who her mother and father and herself drew towards her 
intentionally to assist her in some of those pivotal life periods, life transitions and times during her life. So as advocates, I, you would probably be very interested in the power of that. And that was they moved mountains, essentially changed policy, um, government regulations, all sorts of things to enable Mina to live simply a life that everyone else had access to. So to go to school and to have her own home, um, but very powerful the way that the circle came together to support her to do that, her and her family. So it's a beautiful read um, if you get a chance to do that. Okay, so circles of support as a concept and then the idea of roles-based practice um, is how BCN, Building Community Networks, which is what I said, um, help to manage in here at Belonging Matters. That's what we've combined, those two concepts, in order to create this idea of building community networks and running and facilitating circles of support with people. Roles-based practice focuses on creating and maintaining valued social roles for people um, who are often marginalised in society and not offered the same opportunities as other citizens. So, you know, in this case, we're talking about people with uh, disability. The value of focusing on valued roles is that, like I said earlier, it can counter some of the negative impact that discrimination and things like that have on the life of a person and the wounding that can occur because of that. Um, so we focus on it entirely in terms of the work we do around circles of support, but all of our work at Belonging Matters. And valued roles give us access to the good things in life. And the good things in life are universal. You know, if you ask that question, and we do often in workshops, people talk about the same things. They talk about home, love, financial security, relationships, community, all of these things that are valued in our, in our life, the good things in life. And when someone has a valued role, they're more able to access those good things. And when they don't, they're less able to, as, as unfortunately we see as well in our society. Valued roles are also important in forming our identity, you know, our sense of worth, our sense of purpose, our self-esteem, all of these really important things um, can be built and grown through how we take up valued roles in our lives. And if you just think for a moment for yourself about all of the valued roles that you may take up and the importance of that, how it holds you in stature and how um, it makes you feel and how you are as a person and how you grow in confidence, et cetera, because of those. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're trying to um, intentionally bring into the lives of people that we work with and that we support in our circles work. It also um, has a big impact on how we see ourselves and also how others view us. Um, so somebody in a valued role is generally viewed quite highly, um, for example. So they're just some clues to why we work with valued roles um, as well as circles of support. So here's a little example. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Diane, she, her story. She, um, there's a picture there of people gathering in her home. She's having a circle of support meeting there being facilitated and she has family, friends, uh, uncle, mum and dad, uh, an ex-support worker, etc. People in that room there, her circle of support, helping her to make decisions and grow. Some of the outcomes that we've seen for her over the years um, is the idea of her, um, for example, her business development. Actually, that's been the biggest thing. And you can see the little images here. Can you believe it? Designs um, and a card, an image of a card that she makes and now sells. So the circle of support have been imperative in her setting that up. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about how that happened in the next slide. But she now lives in her own home. She's a host, she's had or she's organised things like meet and greet your neighbours days, she's had barbecues to try to introduce herself to her local, you know, tenants in the in the apartment building that she's in. She loves baking cakes and entered competitions at the Melbourne show, for example, to do to do that kind of thing. And she's done a lot of fundraising um, at numerous places, had pamper nights, girls' nights in order to raise money. She, she's very fond of that, wanting to contribute in that way to her community. So just a few, just a snapshot of what's um, possible. So but, but creating a business of her own, moving into her own home, doing fun run with her family, friends, her circle. All of this has come about because of this circle of support. 
So here's an idea. I'll give you an example of how this happens and how but the idea of thinking about valued roles in the context of that is important. So Dee has an interest in art. She absolutely loves arts and crafts, that kind of a thing. She also has an interest in people. She's a very social woman and she'll make friends connect with people, particularly in you know the street, the shops, streets of shops where she lives. Everybody knows her. So we know that about her. We focused on her interest. We, as in her circle of support, have done this work, focused on her interest in art and her interest in socialising and being with people. Then people in that circle of support helped her to brainstorm ideas, okay? Let's think about all the roles that you could possibly take up if you're an artist and if you like people. What, what, could, all, what could this look like? So brainstorming and thinking and coming up with ideas and Dee's a part of that as well as saying yes or no to those, you know, those ideas. Finally, this idea lands that she'd like to make and sell greeting cards. So she was a part of all of that decision-making, all of the brainstorming around that and then decides, yes, I'm interested in that. Let's follow that idea. So that grows into the role of becoming a business owner, creating and selling business uh, greeting cards in her local community where she can go and meet people, talk to all of those people she used to talk to with no real purpose. Now she has a purpose. She has cards of immense value. You know, they're beautiful cards and she can go and sell them. So she has a valued role in her community. And if you look at the second little chart there, um, some of these are important things in terms of um, social role valorization, which is another thing that we, you know, it's very important um, principles that underlie the work that we do at Belonging Matters. So, for example, that D presents with such a positive, you know, her appearance is positive. She's got a, a uniform, a T-shirt with her logo design on it when she goes out to sell her cards. She's got valued imagery around her. Her cards are beautifully handcrafted and designed. Um, they're top quality cards and they've all been made by her. The designs have been made by her and then, you know, reproduced for the use of card sales. She's, she's undertaking valued activity in her community. So she, here there's a photo, you may or may not be able to see the detail, but she's um, showing her cards to some customers um, in her local strip of shops, potentially to sell or to um, have at the store, you know, for them to on sale her cards at that store. She also is in valued settings. So there's another image there of her selling her cards at the local bank. Um, and she's around other people in valued roles. So all of this is exceptionally important. She's not segregated in a day program somewhere stuck doing an art and craft activity whilst she would enjoy an art and craft activity. This is beyond that. This is her having a meaningful, purposeful role in her community that still allows her to participate in art and craft type activities for the purpose of running her own business and making a little bit of income, meeting people, being a businesswoman. A business owner. So there's a big difference there. And I just want to acknowledge Judith Snow um, in the work of Circles of Support. Judith was um, way back when she initiated essentially the idea of a circle of friends was brought about. She was a 28 year old woman living in a geriatric ward of a hospital. Um, she was intelligent working and um, studying at the, at the time at a university. And her friends, Marsha and Jack, when they discovered that the living conditions that, that she was in um, were appalled. But what they did was come around her and create a circle of friends around her that were able to advocate on her behalf. And she was, again, one of the first women, I think it was in, in Canada, um, that enabled individual funding in order to live in her own home with the support that she required um, to sustain her life. I'll just read a quote from Judith Snow. Most significantly, circles are powerful because they exist to honour, support and make available a person's capacities and interests, not his or her deficits. Support circles are formed to be vehicles for people to discover and to talk about ways in which a person could be contributing to the wider community through often overlooked interests and talents. So we thank her for her initial work and then um, as a succession from that, the, the, the leading into the idea and the concept of circles of support and that have spread, you know, that has spread around the world now. 
So I'm going to show you in a moment um, a story of a circle of support in operation that this will be Brody's circle of support and you can view this in your own time again at either the COSAM website or our website Talks That Matter. The COSAM website they were partially involved in the, well they were involved in the funding of this um, filming of this project and we filmed it so you can see some more information about circle support on their website as well. So yes, let's play Brody's video and enjoy, sit back and relax and enjoy his story. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brody. This is my circle of support facilitator from Belonging Matters, Jody. Hi. So now we're going to talk about how the circle of support works. That's right, Brody. We're going to talk about how your circle was formed, the purpose of the circle, what it does for you, and how the circle supports you to achieve your goals. Cool. Perfect. Let's do it. So before the circle of support, I talk with Jody about the, the goals and the stuff that is important to me. So Brody, what do you want to talk about in tonight's meeting? So I'd like to talk about the fact that I want to become a barista and hang out more with friends. Perfect. So I want you to remember that this is all about you, yep, yeah? and at any time you feel uncomfortable, you make sure you sing out, okay? Alright, cool. Yeah? And also it's going to be exciting because we've got Noel's joining us for the first circle meeting. Cool, I'm excited myself. Yeah, great. The whole idea of the circle was mentioned to me by my mum. She explained to me how it would help me reach my goals and she also helped me set it up. When I first put the idea of a circle of support to Brody, he was excited and really, really positive. I think it's so important for Brody to have a circle of support because it helps him take control of his life. When I asked people to be part of Brody's circle, at first I was nervous, but the response was really positive. I helped Brody form the circle, first of all by discussing with him the purpose of the circle and then Having, we had a chat about who might be good people to invite. I helped Brody choose who might be part of the circle by thinking about um, who was a wholehearted person who could make a contribution. It's always good when the members arrive, we talk about everyday stuff. I've known Brady for some time and I just feel it's just an honour to be a part of something so exciting and beneficial for him but also for me like I really enjoy it I have a good time and, and my friends are here and I feel well supported as well. So it's really good I've enjoyed tonight so it's my first night here and it's great to see the progress that he's made. Brody lives over the road for me and it's great to sort of you know have uh, the opportunity to catch up with him he comes for lunch uh, sometimes on Sundays which is really cool and uh, yeah, it's, it's good, to, good to help out in whatever way we can. Just saying how, um, how inspiring it is to, to see all the, the progress that has, has come from, from all the things that we've discussed during these circle meetings. And for a support worker as well, it's, um, it can sometimes be a bit lonely if you're, if you're out there you know, doing all this stuff yourself. So coming to these circle meetings and getting all of that um, encouragement from everyone and um, you know, some some people to, to touch base with and, um, you know, think about different ideas and it's been more, you know, collaborative and it makes makes my my life so much easier and so much, yeah, more, more rewarding and, yeah. It, it's an absolute privilege. Um, I, I actually, when I leave, I feel uplifted and completely inspired by, um, by Brody's um, ability to communicate and by the circle, the, his support 
network around him. It, it's uh, something I'd love to see in place for all, all humans, you know, but to, to watch it and to see Brody, I don't get to come all the time, but to see the, the impact, the positive impact this is having in Brody's life is, it, it, it touches my heart and I'd love to see people be able to have this opportunity with disabilities or even fully able people. It's, it's just a wonderful support in people's lives. take Brody's circle meeting is to always ensure that he's the main focus and that he's listened to and respected. To ask questions of the circle, to ensure that we're coming up with great ideas and suggestions, to keep the circle on track, to ensure that it's always about Brody and around him having roles and a purpose within the community and at the end we always walk away with actions that are going to lead towards Brody achieving his goals, which is having roles within the community. So, Brody, how do we make this happen? Does anyone know, anyone have any contacts of cafes, people in the city? I can, I can I don't really help in that area. <laughs> <laughs> of course um, you can, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was thinking about this too, Brody. Um, if, if you weren't so focused on the city but um uh, like i know a lot of cafes more in, in the suburbs yeah and, and potentially in like a shopping center so what does everyone see as our next step if andre's got the contacts what do we what do you want to see as this next step to make it happen i guess um practice like i guess if i can ask um I practice on Thursdays and Fridays at the bar, main coffee. Circles of support are all about relationships and everyone having a common purpose. So maybe ask if you could have a go on the coffees and just like it's any, like any skill, the more you do it, the more better you get. Yeah. And faster actually, and better quality and all sort of stuff. And mm. it's just all you got to do is ask and they're not going to say no, no, no. Mm. You know? That's great, Brady. Because so there's an then, opportunity there anyway. And what can you do with that experience? What's that going to help you do? Um, so when I go to work, get it, like, be able to know what coffees are and how it's made and... Mm. It'll build your resume up a bit mm. too. Yeah. And there, there could be somebody who comes to the church who right. wants a cafe. Like, loves your coffee and... Yeah. Mm. 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 That's, that's, right. that's a that's, great idea. Yeah. That's right. Mm. Do you think maybe um, a way of getting into a cafe, maybe we could ask the owners if, if um, you could do a couple of hours towards the end of the day mm. Yeah. Um, just to, to introduce you to, um, to the different machinery and, and get used to, to making coffee when it's not so busy. The more regular that Brody Circle meets, the stronger the relationships become, which therefore leads to better outcomes for Brody to achieve his goals. Well, that was what we talked about last Circle too, was with your math. You said the math, you know, that's a blockage right now, but so to practice and to learn a few skills there would be great, and so it sounds like the same for your handwriting. But that doesn't stop you from keeping on I know. doing what you're doing. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Some of the goals that the Circle of Support has helped me with is working as a barista and studying music and hospitality and tape. All right, let's add a uh, e on the third beat. So E1 is going to be along here, right? Because that's C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. Okay, and then follow along until we get to the third beat. And you see how in the background it's kind of like light lines and dark lines? Yeah, so yeah. if you know that's just above the black one that is here. Alright, yeah, double click there. Exactly. Alright, how about you extend that E for the whole length of that beat? So all the way to the fourth beat. Exactly. Cool. Right. I was alone, this bird had flown, so I lit a fire, isn't it good, Norwegian Circle of support gives me confidence and it helps me achieve 
the goals that are important to me. So Brody, how do you think tonight's meeting went? Um, yeah, it's good to see the people. Now I have a plan to um, become a barista and hang out with friends. That's fantastic. So what I'll do is I'll make a time to follow that up with you. How does that sound? Cool. Beautiful. Bye. Bye. So I hope you enjoyed that opportunity to just dive into the intimacy of a circle of support on, and its potential. Um, and you saw there so many opportunities for Brody to be assisted in making decisions about his life. Um, and that's come into full fruition in all areas of his life now. And I'll show you a little bit about that. But some of the other benefits, for example, he has become a student not only of that music course he's also undertaken a hospitality course and has just finished a personal training course now it's a young man and is exploring lots of options um, in terms of his interests and passions he's a classmate and a friend an employee he was an assistant landscaper he's participated like as an employee at a sporting stadium in the food outlets um, he's a church member now that and that's an interesting progression in terms of his decision making over time that was um a movement his mother didn't have any involvement in at all. Most of the other things she's had a part in supporting and, you know, helping him make decisions. But that came through relationship that he had with other young men his age. Um, and he's become a full, full engaging member of a church community that he loves and he's thriving and he participates and helps out and goes to social gatherings, all of that stuff. And that through... Um, you know, over time, making decisions more and more and more, he's been able to um, just set up stuff himself in his own life without the support of key people in his life, which is just tremendous. Um, he's a gym member. He's a bodybuilder now. He's also a tenant and a housemate, and that was a big project that the circle assisted him with as well in how to think about and think through how do I live in my own home, where do I want to live, who do I want to live with, how does that look, all of those things. And he's also become a leader, a presenter um, and a board member. So you can see lots of rich and valued roles um, have come from his involvement in a circle of support. And that I'll show you in another slide, but he... He was in a day program not that long ago. So some of the benefits that we've seen for numerous other people as well with disabilities, many people have left day programs and instead enjoy now a real life in their community. Some of them have set up businesses and some of them have found employment. They've become more involved and engaged in their own life. And that's what I was just describing with Brody, how we've seen him do that over time, more and more saying yes to things, saying no to things, having his voice heard and being able to create opportunities for himself in his own life. People have begun to enjoy the meetings more or had certainly more comfort with them. And we're talking about people with significant need as well in, in some of these contexts where um, some people couldn't sit at, around the kitchen table or the coffee table in the lounge room. That was way too much for them. But over time, they're contributing now, they're attending meetings, they're making contributions, they're signing. You know, one of, my, uh, one of the young men I, I work with signing, Team Mike, it's time for my circle meeting. You know, so really important changes that happen because people are valued, they're listened to and action comes from them. Um, and they're not, you know, people talking about them or trying to make decisions on their behalf. The things that occur in a circle meeting are validated, informed and empowered by the individual themselves. And hence, if something comes out of that, it's of real value and they can make the connection and see the worth of it. Benefits for families um, include but are not limited to certainly people being afraid to ask for people to join their circle, but, but realising actually that people did come um, and that they really were quite honoured to be invited into a circle of support. Siblings, exceptionally glad to be included in the circle and to start the conversation about what happens when mum and dad are no longer here, for example, um, and the emergence then of the safeguard for that future. 
you know, for the future of an individual with um, an intellectual disability, who, who how are they going to continue to make decisions in the long term? How is the vision going to be held with them and for them into the future when their parents are no longer there? And circle members, lots of benefits. People bond, they um, bond together on the vision and also on the journey. And you heard about Dee's, you know, that lovely gathering that they had at a fun run. They had a terrific day out together raising money for... I think it's one of the children's hospitals. People sharing ideas, having connections and getting practical assistance, you know, from each other as well. So it's all about the circle focus person, the person at the centre, but also every circle member benefits from their participation in a circle. People have fun together, they create relationships, friendships are formed, and people generally feel exceptionally privileged to be a part of a circle because it makes a difference in someone's life. Some of the other benefits is that having an ongoing structure and also facilitation can really help hold a vision for an inclusive life for somebody and help keep people on track. That's been one of the powerful benefits. Um, some circles have taken on like an interest in some of the detailed work around such things as NDIS planning um, or um, how to bring on support staff or some of this kind of thing where, where they're getting very intricate, you know, how to help someone move into their own home, um, huge life change, like huge areas in someone's life. And they certainly are a very real way for people to be assisted with making day-to-day -day decisions and also big life decisions. Um, you know, and this comes to mind, one young woman that I work with around moving into her own home. Um, and the conversations, the discussions, the lively debate that occurred at a circle meeting and her expressing her unhappiness where she was living, which was shared, you know, a shared living arrangement with other people with disabilities. And so through that ongoing dialogue, um, that circle was able to assist her to move into her own home with housemates that didn't have disability. And she's a flourishing, thriving and exceptionally happy young woman now because of that. So it's a big life decision but that the circle was pivotal in assisting her to manage and to make and to make happen in her life. So circles certainly can help people make unique choices and also um, respect and regard the person for who they are and they are at the centre of a circle of support. So people are seen as unique and whole, um, not just seen as um, for their disability. People consider them worthy of attention and inclusion, um, that a per person has purpose and a full meaning and in inclusive life. These are all important things about being respected that a circle should uphold um, and certainly empower in people. That the individual has valued roles and is not treated as a second class citizen and certainly not devalued. Um, and in fact, that the actions taken by the circle and the decisions that they help a person make would be to counter that devaluation as I've talked about, to create valued and meaningful life and roles for a person. Um, that their roles align with their chronological age and interest, um, that they're not treated um, as children if they're not. Um, and that their circle puts them at the centre of the conversation and at the centre of decision making. And you heard that in Brody's story, um, you know, conversation, discussion, dialogue happening and then throwing it back to him, what do you think, what would you like, what are your thoughts, you know, and then they proceed from there. So it's a very important function. And that people who actually care about me, love me, um, are in my life by choice. They're the ones that are helping me make my decisions and they're the ones that are helping to uphold my vision for a good life. And that's not dissimilar to anybody, people that don't have a disability. People have people in their lives. We are all interdependent on others. We do all listen to the opinions, ideas, values of our peers, our colleagues, our friends, our family members, our partners. They all contribute to the mix and then we will make a decision about something you know our life and, and a circle is exactly like that it's just an intentional way of bringing people together around someone so making choices a little bit about how this might happen um, 
but people are informed about choices through supported decision making within a circle of support. So for example, and I'll show you the image down the bottom there is actually where Brody, Brody went to a day centre. She, he was in a day program for many, many years. That was, well, not many years, but that's where he, out of school, that's where he was just funneled into. And before his, the idea of a circle of support, he didn't know any different. He was just going to be doing that. Um, and that day centre would have been where he was probably for numerous years. Um, at the time, if you would have asked him, do you want to stay here? He probably would have said, yeah, I'm pretty happy. I've, you know, and he did. I've got a couple of friends or people I am friendly with and I know the woman who runs it. It's all right. I do a little bit of music. But that was it. There was nothing else. And what we were able to show him through conversations and involvement as a circle was the more of that life. And now that he's got the more of that life, he's been to TAFE, he's got other friends, he's had work, he's moved into his own home. He looks back at that time in that day centre as, as debilitating and he can see the difference now. So informed choices can often be about trying, tasting and reflecting, you know, giving people the opportunity to try and taste at life because they may not have had the experience that can lead them to make a good decision in the first place. You know, it involves listening to people, to what they say, but also what they don't say, to listen to their hesitation, their fear, their concern, um, but also to offering something that's new, something beyond what they may be able to imagine for themselves in order that they can progress, grow, change, you know, explore life. And also having high expectations for growth and development and inclusion is pivotal and it's a really important part of the circles work that we do. And what happens is that people learn to make choices and they become empowered through a process of creating a good life for themselves, through a process of having a circle of supportive people around them who are helping them make decisions all every step along that way from day to day decisions to bigger life decisions. Someone like Brody now has moved on from this image here where he was gardening. That was a great opportunity, but he didn't want to be a gardener. He didn't want to do that job after he had a go at it. He wanted to try it, but then he realised that's not for me. So he got to make that choice, move on to something else. He's had experiences, valued activities at TAFE, numerous courses now that he's trying and he's had employment, you know, opportunity to grow, develop his skills. And he's also around other people that are in valued settings and valued roles. So that final picture there is him with his personal trainer, um, who also acts now really as a mentor in terms of him as a young man achieving, aspiring to be a bodybuilder. Um, and he is a very buff young man at the moment. So he's been making and learning how to make choices as he progresses and grows through the involvement in his circle of support. So here's just a quote to ponder. Support circles are a very powerful strategy for inviting ordinary people to walk alongside, focus on and make a commitment to people with a disability and their families as they dream, plan and achieve the lives that they want. And that's thanks to Marg Rogers from uh, CRU in Queensland. And we have colleagues from numerous estates that um, do some good work with, within this area as well. So just a few tips I wanted to share with you uh, as advocates to consider. Firstly, is a circle of support the right idea for, for you or for the person that you know? Um, how are they going to be educated about circles of support? Because done badly, they can be terrible. Okay, so how do you educate people about them and do them well? Uh, and how would you empower people to set up a circle? So just some questions to ponder. Here are some tip sheets uh, that we have. I would like you know, to let you know about those because there was a number of them on circles of support. So you can just go to our website if you want some more tips and tricks around circles. And just quickly, I'll talk very briefly about facilitation because facilitation we have found to be quite an important piece in the support development of a circle of support uh, because with good facilitation all of the good stuff will happen and if you've got poor facilitation or no facilitation a circle may not have the same outcomes uh, that we're I'm talking about today um, you know so good facilitation will keep the person at the center they will listen to and engage the person help them make decisions focus and encourage and enable the voice of that person with a disability. They'll check in with them about decisions constantly and they'll help the circle figure out ways to enable the, those decisions that are made or the ideas that are, that are 
have come forth, turn them into actions and how to make that action happen for a person. And there are some limitations to circles. They're not a be the be all and end all. They do take a bit of effort. They take work. I wouldn't just have a circle for the sake of it. I would consider it very, de very definitely because it's a lot of effort to go into that. You certainly want to not lose sight of the person um, or be talking about a person. You don't want poor values and vision embedded within a circle of support. That's why that facilitation or people with strong values is important. You certainly wouldn't want it to be service driven. You don't want it to become a staff or a team meeting. We had a beautiful circle of support set up and a um, support coordinator came in with all the best intentions, but came in and pretty much railroaded it, started talking about service delivery, therapy supports, all of this kind of stuff. It took the focus away from the individual. So it's just a big caution there. Think that the circle can meet every need. They can't, they're not a, you know, they're not the answer to everything. Be aware of dominance by one member of a circle um, and the willingness of members to take on tasks and challenges. That's important. So you need people to be able to say yes to things. Certainly you don't want an organisation left to one person. And in the case of some of the circles that I work with, that can sometimes be the mother. So figuring out ways for that not to happen is important. They do take commitment and energy, but they are certainly worth it. Um, and you do need to think about succession planning. People will come and go um, in someone's circle, but it's so important to invest in relationship forming that is real and unpaid because it will safeguard people into the future. And sometimes circles um, need a bit of redesigning. So you might, don't throw the baby out with the, with the bath water. Sometimes they don't work. You know, and if they don't, you need to consider why they don't. Reinvest, re-engage in the purpose and rethink about who the membership is and think about how it's being facilitated. Start again, redesign. Just some acknowledgements there. You can have a look at that. There's a new guide that we'll be writing um, and releasing fairly soon on circles of support. So if you're interested, please let us know and we can send you that. We also have a very comprehensive resource list about circles of support. So again, if you're interested in them, you want more information, do just email me and let me know. I can send you those things. A couple of questions to you as the audience. I hope that you feel that you know more about circles of support as a result of this session or that you've gained skills and knowledge. And also I hope that you would consider sharing information with people in the future. But there you go. If you'd like more information, there's uh, our email there and you can contact me directly, Teresa. Uh, just ask for Teresa or talk about circles and I'll get that information. So I think we want to hand over to questions now. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Teresa. It's really useful. Decision making support is a really pressing topic in the advocacy sector at the moment. We're experiencing so many issues, um, particularly around decision making support in the NDIS, where participants who need support, but there's no one available to support them to make decisions. And often it's left to the overstretched advocacy sector to try and fill the gaps. But I think before we go to questions, the first thing I'd like to highlight is that the recording of this session, the slides associated with it, will be available on the Darby website, including all the emails, so make sure you keep your eye out for that. We have time for a few questions, so I'll go to the first one. Where can we participate in facilitated training? This seemed to be an exceptionally practical and beneficial program. That's a very good question. Um, we certainly provide some training um, around facilitation. We call it, um, what do we call it? Have uh, conversations that matter. So we generally often run a two-day workshop on that. So that's one way. Um, but you know, the facilitation skills are a skill unto themselves. So you know, there are numerous facilitation courses that people could take up. You know, to to learn that skill. But you want to be matching that skill with really good values. And I guess that's what we we do here at Belonging Matters. We do match the skill with the values as well. So we're trying to teach people to become facilitators, but also have really solid values, um, you know, the Towards a Better Life um, SRV training is is a must for us and any worker or, or contractor that we bring on. But yeah, I mean, facilitator training 
in its and of itself it could be accessed um, through a number of different areas. So you know, Google things. We um, used creative facilitation training through uh, Viv McWaters in Geelong. She's a consultant, so she does some online work. You could look her up as a starting point. Right. Thanks. Next question. In thinking about dignity of risk, how does the circle of the poor program make sure that the person with disability still has the choice to make decisions that other people in their lives want to stop them from doing? Yeah, well, look, a circle of support is built on the premise that it's people around the individual that do care about them deeply. And so that's an inbuilt mechanism to some degree. But what we have seen, I'll give you an example, a young woman um, who had talked already with her family about having more financial control, you know, control over her finances, um, and that her parents having hesitancy, resistance, you know, uncertainty about that because of the risk in, associated with her perhaps overspending or you know mismanaging her own money. What happened though was that she was able to talk to me as a facilitator of her circle of support about that and I and asked her permission if we could talk about that in her circle. She said yes and what we did was essentially open that up for debate and discussion in her circle. The result of that was such that her parents actually saw how um, what an important decision this was that she was making and what an important appeal this was that she was having um, over her own life. And every other circle member agreed with her um, and suggested that her parents let her do this. Like, and we discussed how, how are we going to do this in a safe way, in a way that, you know, she's not going to put herself at risk financially, all of those things. And we discussed it and they, from that point, helped her to do that. She's now managing a lot of her money online, um, which was unheard of two years ago that, that she just, that was not an option for her in her life. And so the circle, that's the mechanism, is that you build trusted relationship with the individual. She was trusted me enough to come to me with that, and I trusted the circle and her family enough to raise that as an open conversation, and we came to an agreement, and it changed her life. Fantastic. Next one, I think this will be the last question. How might a circle of support be set up around someone who has no clear relationship outside of services in their lives, like no family and friends? That's a really big question. Um, and I don't necessarily know the answer to that. Um, we haven't done a lot of work in that space. Um, but what I do know about that is that if you can find one person, you know, support a person to find one individual who's invested in their life, then that's the start. And from there, you can engage. Um, I would be trying to look at engaging people based on their interest and based on the purpose of their circle. So you're essentially asking community members to come in and be a part of their circle and to make a commitment to that. So I would ask for a, probably a year's commitment from an individual, you know, this is this is Tom, Tom's interested in this, this is what Tom would like to achieve. You know, we think you would be a good member on his circle of support for these reasons, you know, you, you might share the same interest, you, you might... Um, yeah, whatever the, the, you might have particular expertise in an area that he's trying to achieve. So we'd like to invite you, you know, would you be committed to that? Would you be willing? You know, and if you can gather three, three people, two, three people to start with, that'll, mm -hmm. that'll be changing people's lives. Yeah. If they're unpaid, you know, if they're genuinely there because they want to be. Um, yeah. So it would take a little bit of work, but it's about scoping community focusing on their interest, focusing on the purpose of the circle, what you're trying to achieve, and then trying to find the community member that best fits that. Um, and that it's not another person who has need themselves, and it's not just service providers. However, in the case of someone who really doesn't have any, you know, if that's a big thing, you could even start there, but get those service providers around the table to find the unpaid people to come in not for them to be ongoing the circle, but they may initially form the brainstorming hub about how are we going to get unpaid people in this person's life. So yeah, you could start there. Yeah, it really is. It's a tricky one. It's not a perfect model. But yeah, but really, thank you for sharing your expertise today. It's really um, 
there are so many different issues and different ways of approaching it. But yeah, I commend the work you're doing and I really appreciate your time today. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Melissa. Thank you for the invitation and I hope it's been of some use to people. So yeah, feel free to connect if you're interested more. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. We've come to a close of the final session this week. Thank you to the Australian interpreters and captainers for their hard work today and this week. Thank you to Show Division for bringing this production to you today. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and we'll see you next time.